Hey everybody, welcome back to the program. Today, I have a very special interview with Patrick Milligan. He is the Senior Director of a and for Rhino Entertainment. And we're gonna talk about the brand new Rhino High Fidelity Records that came out in 2023. The first two releases are the Cars debut and this John Coltrane album. Now, these are limited to 5,000 copies each, but we're gonna get into the nitty gritty of this, talk about the analog nature of these albums, among other things, and possible, what what we could look forward to in the future. So let's check it out. Today we're talking about Rhino High Fidelity. I wonder if you could just give like a quick like elevator pitch of like the concepts behind it and then we can go into more detail about the history and whatnot. Um, you know, there are a number of labels, Mobile Fidelity, Acoustic Sounds, labels like that, that we've worked with over the years, licensing material too. Um, and we've never really been in that lane and it just, we kind of started thinking maybe we should start looking at doing some titles like that. And, um, there were a few things kicked around. I was asked to look into doing some half speed masters, which quite frankly, I'm not a big fan of because I think, you know, if you get into the technicalities of how you're reproducing things at half speed, you've got low frequency material that can't really reproduce when it's played at half speed. So it's below the, you know, what a record can really, what a cutting head can okay. reproduce. So you kind of lose some low end. So I, because of that, I've never been really a huge proponent of that, but also in looking into the current methods of half speed mastering, it's all digital. And once I found that out, I was just like, I, I, I don't want to go that path. So, Oh, gotcha. So what we decided to do was let's just amplify the things that we do that are good and make these the highest quality they can be by, you know, mastering from the original tapes, which quite honestly, we often do whenever we can anyway. Right. We're using Kevin Gray, who, you know, everybody pretty much acknowledges is the king of mastering and everybody would love to get their hands on something he's cut. So, <laughs> um, and we do use Kevin for other stuff too, but the packaging, you've seen it. It's it's super yeah. deluxe, really high end, uh, you know, thick cardboard, glossy gate folds, um, and we're pressing on 180 gram vinyl at optimal. We we really, I mean, I know there's a lot of controversy over pressing plants, and people are very opinionated, but. Right. Most of the people we've talked to, I know Bernie Grunman for sure, and Kevin Gray as well, really feel that optimal. And and in terms of you know European pressing plants and stuff, they are they are the kings. They've been doing this for a while, and we have really good results with them. We do use other pressing plants, and others of other plants are good too. But I do find that the optimal pressings are consistently quiet, just really clean, and it's you know kind of what we wanted to do. So we just took every aspect of putting together these albums and made them the highest quality they can be. And I think the response has been very positive. We sold through on the cars already, which is incredible. You know, we were very conscious too of trying to do something at a price point that wasn't, you know, sort of off-putting to people. And, you know, quite honestly, some of these other high-end packages, the mobile fidelity things and stuff like that can end up going for over a hundred dollars. And clearly, you know, the mobile fidelity things that are two LP 45 RPM and these big, huge, thick boxes. And they're, they're super high end and they're really, really nice. And I have a few of those and I love them, but we didn't really want to go quite to that level. We wanted to do something that was yeah. a little bit easier for people to get into. And I think people have responded well to that. So I think we kind of found the sweet spot with that. But. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I, I would agree. I mean, it's, especially with just regular records pushing $30 now for a single exactly, LP. Yeah. And yeah, we should mention these are limited to 5,000 and they're numbered. Was there a reason behind the 5,000 or, or it just kind of made sense manufacturing wise to... It made sense. I mean, I think, you know, these days we sort of look at if we can do 3,000 on a record, it's worth doing. Yeah. And you, you don't really want to press more vinyl than you know you can sell because you end up sitting on it and yeah. you have to pay to store it and all that stuff. So I think, you know, we were, we were testing the waters a little bit to see. And I think, quite honestly, we're a little even surprised with the success and that the cars sold so rapidly and, and was so well received. So I think we thought 5,000 was you know, a reasonable attainable number and we didn't want to be too aggressive. So, right, right. I mean, quite honestly, now that we know sort of what the potential of this is, we may look at doing um, bigger runs on some, some of the other titles we're looking at it just depends. And the of cars course. just, the cars was just sort of the perfect title to lead with. I think people just really were, were ready for that. And, and I think that other 
times that this has been done has not been well received. I won't call anybody out. So I've seen a lot of these shootouts that people are doing at the, you know, original pressings and other oh, high, yeah. high, you know, high end versions. And that's I think really been part of the success for us is just, you know, the word kind of got out that this is the one to have and people really responded to that. So I'm thrilled about that. And then just for like clarification, like what what's the are we staying all analog or are we is there a digital step somewhere? They're all analog. Yeah, there's no digital in any of these so far. But we I think that it's it ended up sort of getting messaged that this series is going to be all analog. And the truth of it is okay. not necessarily, because if right. there are digital albums, once you get into the 80s, that are amazing sounding records that deserve. I mean, yeah, you know, think of the Steely Dan records from, you know, 2000 or the Donald Fagan album from 1982 or whatever. Those are amazing albums and people would love to have those cut by Kevin Gray. So at some point, I think, you know, we'll we'll probably be digging into some of that stuff but so far everything's been analog and i think people are kind of more comfortable with that so <laughs> we'll have to sort of figure out how to message uh, once it gets to the digital world but but it doesn't seem to me that we want to leave that stuff on the table just because it's not analog so exactly you know i think it's a great move i think just uh just having that transparency i mean even like just putting it on the on the oh, that, you can't really see that but just yeah on on the side here or wherever on the back you like you yeah. know just to make it clear no we'll be very clear and very honest and like you say transparent we don't <clears throat> we don't want any controversy about <laughs> having gone out of the analog <laughs> chain but we're we're not you know again we're not trying to profess that that's exactly what we're doing where where the album requires a different process we'll have to look into that so okay so the rollout we have these these first two john coltrane the cars Mm -hmm. and then i remember at the event it was going to be quarterly so every three months another pair of records will come out we may step that up a little bit okay Um, okay yeah i think we started off quarterly partly just you know we wanted to see how these were going to do we didn't really know yeah and obviously production issues especially with the vinyl the lead time and getting capacity and stuff like that we didn't want to be too aggressive we we have a pretty a pretty uh, robust schedule beyond these releases too so we always have a lot of stuff going on right 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 um but yeah we i think we're looking at trying to step them up to every couple of months if we can and that might eventually become the the rhythm but how do you decide what to do? That seems so daunting. <laughs> yeah, it, it can be kind of, and I'm, uh, yeah, with these, I mean, honestly, we originally had the first Cars album and another album planned. Yeah. And we sort of decided maybe we should vary it a little bit and and come with a jazz title too, because it just seems like, you know, that's sort of a good uh courting the jazz audience for for you know audiophile releases seems like that's it's a good fit yeah um and and the coltrane album has done quite well too but i mean not like the cars did i mean the cars has sold through so um so it was just trying to find something we could vary it and see you know what yeah uh, yeah what people waters. responded to so i think you know the first few um batches of releases will probably be kind of a rock and a jazz title but that we might mix that up as it goes along so um we have the next few releases planned we've already got um, packaging samples for the next two releases so um so yeah we're we're moving ahead and there will be more (laughs) amazing but in, in terms of what we decide um certainly one of the first criteria is just a great sounding record and yeah. it's obviously trying to find something that you know resonates to a big enough audience that you can sell enough of them and i can tell you i have a lot of albums on my list that i'm getting a bit of pushback because people are like how are we going to sell that i'm like once people get into this and they know that these are good they'll you know they'll take a chance with these things there's just some really beautiful sounding jazz albums in the warner catalog yeah you know, even from the seventies that, that were really overlooked and I'd love to get those out. And I'm, I'm hoping that with, you know, the, the response to the series and that people seem to be into it, it's a good price point stuff that maybe people will sort of be able to go, Oh yeah, I need to hear that record. I don't know it, but it must be good if it's in the series and it will sound great. And so we're we're certainly not going to put out anything lo-fi or anything like that, but but we might start if if I can push the envelope a little bit, getting into some stuff that doesn't really otherwise get touched. So, I mean, we're still working with 
you know, all the other um, audiophile labels too. So there, there's a lot of stuff in the pipeline with them too. And okay. some of it's pretty, some of it's pretty major stuff too. So okay. and we're, we're really trying not to step on the toes of, of those people too. So I, I mean, I think it's a really good move as someone who collects vinyl to like, you know, obviously have one that's super popular, but then also give one that's maybe lesser known just because it might be rare to find one in great condition, an original pressing. And just so it kind of, it create, it helps to boost or that market a bit, just to kind of give like people a chance to own it that might not be able to afford the, you know, $300 record or however much exactly. it goes for. That That's certainly a, a motivator. I think the challenge is great records that nobody remembers that might be going for a dollar. That's hard to compete with. But at the same time, I think it's, it's partly storytelling too. And if yeah. we, some of these releases, I'm, you know, trying to look at them that they, they can kind of have some connection in a way too. So if there's an album that, you know, a really big album that comes with a lesser album that they have some tie together, that there's some storytelling to do with that. It might, you know, get people over the line of, wondering what this record is they're not familiar with so yeah so we'll see that's that's a little uh <laughs> cryptic but <laughs> <laughs> i get it you got it yeah you can't you can't give away all your secrets um in terms of like possibilities uh i'm not going to hold you to this but let's just say you know when you're looking at another release i mean how 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 uh how far back are you going and how closer to our time are you going <laughs> that's a weird way to say that but like well like... the sky's the limit really oh, okay, i mean cool. i would say that i mean there's a lot of great sounding atlantic jazz records from the 50s even pre-stereo yeah you know but again it's it's finding the thing that resonates with people enough to be wanting to buy it i mean the um lee konitz warren marsh record on atlantic such a great record and it's a great sounding record. It's just it's it's a beautiful record, but not that many people probably know that record. And so it's a tougher sell. And in terms, like I'm saying, you know, more modern stuff, we wouldn't rule anything out. It's just kind of getting to the, cool. the that era where you're really talking about digital masters and how oh, you message yeah. that out. So yeah. But to me, it's it's about great sounding records and records that people want. So it's just finding that sweet spot, hopefully. Yeah, that's great. That's great. And it's, yeah, it's exciting to have another high end product out there. And I, I really like the packaging. It feels substantial. Like you feel like, I feel like you're getting your money's worth out of these. Yeah. I'm, I'm yeah. glad to hear you say that. I, I feel so too. And it seems that that's kind of been, you know, the, the response from consumers. So yeah, it's, um, you know, our production people, Kristen Attaway, uh, who is the pro uh, project mayor, the production manager on this really, really went to the to the wall for this and I, I think they turned out beautifully so the the support of the whole team you know just getting this all together people were really excited about this and and really behind it so it was you know and like i say you're you're putting something out there in the world you hope it does well you don't yeah. really know we're taking a chance and it's the kind of thing too where it's a very very critical audience so it's you know oh, yeah. you're, you're sort of putting yourself out there for a lot of scrutiny and it's like eh, if if this isn't well received we, we kind of shot ourselves in the foot and that's why i say i'm so thrilled that the response has been so positive and then that it's it's sold as well as it has so i you know i think that we're gonna have fun doing this going forward so yeah i'm looking forward to seeing what's next here <laughs> well and the the other thing that i really love about these i'm just i'm such a tape geek Mm. And I love I love looking at tape boxes oh, and documentation yeah, yeah, yeah. and stuff like that. So yeah. we've we've put a you know to sort of really give these some context. Um, the insert shows the actual tape box of the tape yeah. that was used to cut the record. Um, so it's like you you almost get your own copy of the tape. And then what we're doing for the inside is um, we're including liner notes yeah. uh, from somebody that was involved in the making of the album. So. In the case of the Cars record, I, I did a, a Q&A with Elliot Easton, um, and he just, you know, was super nice about answering every stupid, geeky question I had and, <laughs> and getting into the technical aspects of yeah. making the record. So it's really fascinating. Um, and then for the Coltrane album, Tom Dowd had written uh, 
a piece for the Coltrane CD complete box set that we did back in the 90s. And um, we used that because he really gets into talking about what a Coltrane session was like at Atlantic. And so it just gives you kind of, you know, a little behind the scenes, a little feel of the making of the record. It just... You know, again, I think these are great sounding records and I want to have some explanation of what went into making them as great as they are. So so that's that's a fun aspect of this, too. And I'm, I just like I say, I'm, I'm such a tape geek. I'm always the one in the meeting going, hey, what if we put a copy of the tape yeah, box? In the- <laughs> yeah, that's great, because like I, I own other pressings from other audiophile labels, and that's something that definitely does not show up. If anything, you get an advertisement for other records. <laughs> and then it's sort of it's sort of like this. It's not, you know, it, it's something more you would get with a box set, but not at right. the price of a box set, which is which is cool, you know. And I think it's that extra that extra touch too that also adds to the value of it. And the the print quality, like, especially on this coal train, I'm just so impressed because oftentimes it's like a scan of an original and then like there's fuzziness to the print, but this is just spot on. It looks, oh, I'm glad to hear yeah. that. Yeah, we we take a lot of painstaking efforts to to make sure we always, you know, when we can get original artwork. The first thing when we work on a project is to go to the Warner Library and ask if they have a job bag, what elements they have, and like on the Coltrane album, the the Atlantic files from that era are pretty amazing because there's press clippings and as you'll see we've got little notes you know yeah notes from nessa we heard again about the sequencing of the record and stuff like that there was a bunch more of that and we we threw a bunch of stuff in and quite honestly the 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 tape box for that album is a plain brown box so we put some of the notes on it just to kind of give it a little context yeah i mean i think that's so important to have someone like you behind the scenes a, a lover of music a lover of great records you know steering this ship as opposed to like I mean, I know there's a balance between what's going to sell, but also just like, there's a lot of thought that goes into this. It's not just like, let's just pump these out. Yeah, no, it is. And there, there's a whole team of us. I mean, we have a lot of really passionate music fans at Rhino in, in every department from the top down. And, yeah, you know, the excitement about these releases is is really genuine. So it's, you know, it's, it's a great place to work. It's just People are just... You know, we just sit all day and <laughs> talk about music and get like really into some arcane stuff. So you, it's it's an amazing place to work and it's it's fun to get to work on these projects. I mean, moving forward, is it going to be a lot of involvement with the original artists if possible or is it just as much as possible? Yeah, are people involved? Um, we have some projects coming up where we've we've talked to the engineer that was um, responsible for making the album. Uh, another one where we have one of the musicians that was a key part of making the record that we've got notes from. So it's just, it depends. And like in the case of the Coltrane, um, we went with the Tom Dowd notes because literally everybody involved in making that album is no longer with us. Right, right. So it, there, it wasn't really an option to go to anybody. And I considered a few different things, but it's like, well, you talk to somebody who was a mastering engineer at the time or something, but it just really felt like, yeah, they weren't really involved in this record. So the Tom Dowd thing, when I went back and looked at it, it's like, this is kind of perfect for this. Yeah. So, yeah. so we'll just, it's kind of case by case, but as much as we can get, um, you know, anybody from the actual making of the record involved, that's our approach. So. In terms of uh, the vinyl resurgence, and, and, and like a lot of people are talking about that. And I always mm-hmm. have to remind people like, yeah, it's, it's amazing. But, it, you know, the way consumers get music, we'll never see the height that we did, say, in the 70s when it comes to, to vinyl. But uh, from your perspective, like how important is this resurgence of vinyl in terms of a record label? Well, it's really important to us because we're able to sell physical product again. And there was a period, you know, kind of in the early 2000s when Napster and then even iTunes were sort of really coming to the fore that people stopped buying music. And that was largely CDs. And I think, you know, that was during an era where it was really easy to rip CDs. You were getting, you know, something that looked like a CD in the mail every two days from AOL that you just threw away. And I think, you know, the value of CDs kind of kind of dipped and people just didn't care that much anymore. And I think in these days with streaming, so many people get their music that way. And it's great. But I think the vinyl thing really sort of got pumped up because there 
and and obviously a lot of the demographic for vinyl are younger people um that i think you know really more hardcore music fans are not happy to just go oh anybody can go listen to this record the day that it shows up on spotify but i actually own the thing and i've got a thing i can hold and look at and share with my friends and read the liner notes and you know i think back to when i was younger and buying records that was a huge part of the experience you know the artwork yeah. the credits you know every musician on the album you knew the lyrics the songwriters all that stuff and I think that there's just there's a, a, a fierce fan base that wants to show that support. And I think in some cases, too, it's just, you know, people buying stuff from artists, supporting them. Right. And, you know, records are fun. It's a, it's a good fun interface. And, you know, it's just I think, you know, people ask me this and we get into this conversation all the time about LPs versus CDs and our CDs coming back. And you sort of hear different things. On right, that. right, right. But you talk to most any engineer or mastering person, and they acknowledge um, that there is something enjoyable about vinyl. It has a certain sound. The, the, just sort of the interactive aspect of it is is meaningful. But I think the vinyl resurgence thing has been huge for us because you know physical product was very challenging for a while, and, and people were moving away from it. And it's fun. I mean, I, I love making records, and it's super exciting when you do something. You get to see a copy of it and hold it, and yeah. So, I mean, I you know, I still grab CDs and I listen to those. But my turntable's right here, and I still like to put things on and and listen to them. And of course, we do so much vinyl. I'm listening to test pressings all the time too. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, I mean, it's who knows how long it'll last. We keep thinking it's going to die off, but we keep seeing, you know, good numbers and yeah. we're hoping it, it, it goes for as long as it can. So, and we have such an amazing catalog to tap into. It's, oh, I really yeah. want to hopefully get into some, especially with this high fidelity series, get into some, some more cool out of the way stuff that doesn't get the attention that some of the other big high profile stuff does. So. Right. That's that. I'm excited for that. Absolutely. And for me, just, it's just nice because especially with streaming, it's like there and then it's gone. It's very disposable. But when you have like your favorite, it's like, oh, yeah, I love this record. I, you know, and people can come over and learn a little bit about you without even like, you know, you could. Exactly. You know, so that's. Yeah, it's like it's like your book collection, too. You know, exactly. so those things define you and they say something about your, you know, your aesthetics and your personality. So, no, I and I, I think that's a very big part of why records have kind of come back. It's just I have, you know this defines me and it's part of, you know, my collection. So, well, thank you, Patrick, so much for uh, hanging well, out with you. me. Yeah. Yeah. I enjoyed this. Yeah. Well, let's keep in touch. Definitely. Hey everybody. Thank you so much for watching this interview with Patrick. This was a great time. Patrick's an awesome dude. Clearly he loves music and it's so cool to see people like him steering uh, projects like this moving forward. So until then, I want to thank you all so much for watching, but I especially want to thank my members over on Patreon. I'm your vinyl geek and I'll catch you on the flip side.